They'll be calling you a radical because I look like a monkey and I act like one too. Before I go on this chapter, this is a really powerful chapter in Utah history. I want to give thanks to the people that did all the hard work in the early 90s, in the 80s, in regard to nuclear fallout, in regard to nuclear activism, the real fighters, Carol Gallagher, America Ground Zero, The Secret Nuclear Wars, MIT Pages, 1993, Richard Miller, Under the Cloud, The Decades of Nuclear Testing, Mary Dixon, Living and Dying with Fallout, John Goffman, 1992, with Carol Gallagher, Long-Term Effects from Low Doses, which they're powerful. Those are incredible people, and they deserve so much credit. And when I go off on the so-called nuclear advocates, I'm talking about your Busby's, your Gundersons, your... They are nothing but opportunists. I'm going to, this chapter, like I said, when I go into this book in detail, this is laying the foundation. This talk a lot about some of the inventions in, uh, in Utah. Now, if you guys have been watching my vlog, you know the significance of the banana. Chapter 5, Shift F-13. Alan Ashton and Bruce Bastian, Bruce Wayne Bastian, invented the operating system while at BYU. Word perfect. They were in the band. And they were music majors. Bastian was fired as the marching band director. And then on the advice of one of his professors, Alan Ashton, who, by the way, is the grandson of David O. McKay, who was president of the Mormon Church in the 60s when I was a kid, who was a liberal, a progressive, a Democrat. No bullshit, the only one they ever had. That's how much we've changed here. Decided to go after a degree in computer science. Also remember, this is the inventor of the greatest invention of the past half century. The computer operating system was David O. McKay's grandson and Fawn McKay's cousin. Alan Ashton of WordPerfect, along with Bruce Bashan, they invented the operating system, not Microsoft. Like Philo Farnsworth before them, the inventor of the television, yes, another Mormon from Utah and a son of a woman with the same last name, Bastion. Think life has circles? Bastion left the church and is a gay rights advocate. He was the religious overtones that allowed the greatest theft this country had seen in decades. That until W's gang pulled off the greatest crime in this country has ever seen. I have and will compare and contrast in a poetic style, in a post-ignorant style, the economic and social byproducts and set theft of the operating system by Bill Gates and Microsoft has caused. It's toll on Utah and it's windfall in the great Northwest economically. I have never met Bruce Wayne Bashan or Alishan, but I grew up in their wake. Utah right here was in the 1980s and early 90s was a technology hub. It was the infant. I was attending college in the early 90s and learning to use WordPerfect and DAW Shift F7 as all students across the United States and much of the world were. I was in my 30s. I, had fi I finally had mastered in the old buildings where Elizabeth Hall stands now, the last of the old Weber State buildings. I struggled with it. Remember when I graduated from high school in 1978, Weber High, the percent of men my age that knew even how to type, let alone use DOS or WordPerfect, was nearly zero. In high school, I took the type class as a sophomore at Weber High School. There were 102 students in the class. I was the only male. And no, I am not gay. I grew up with a very educated, oriented mother and father. This is, it, this is the kind of learning and expectation they had for me. I had always wanted to be a writer. I love classical literature, and I knew it was ever going to write, I needed to learn to type. I went into class thinking this would be easy. Oh, was I wrong. I had no clue what the American female was going through in those days. The teacher was right out of Hitler's Third Reich and looked like Helga the Terrible and acted like it as well. The class was so competitive it was unreal. I actually tried in that class at Weber High, the only time I tried in any class at Weber High. I, like many Utahns, had rebelled and had a serious drinking habit. I could not hack it. The only time I could not hack any class or anything in those days. I could not keep up. Weber High was full of very beautiful, smart, educated females, like the great writer Fawn McKay herself at Weber High. Smart, educated females. 
and the bloodlines of Alan Ash. And one of the females sitting next to me every day said, Kevin, this is the toughest class I have ever been in. And I speak two foreign languages. One of the Browning girls, I sat right next to her, a few classes, the letter B. She, like so many of the great wealth byproducts of our town, Ogden, Utah, was smart and beautiful in the 70s. That is what Weber County was in those days, smart, rich, and beautiful. Now just beautiful. They did not get dumber. They all moved to California or Salt Lake for real, mostly Northern California. Next time you're at the San Francisco MoMA, take a look at the name on the wall, Wattis from Utah, Paul and Phyllis Wattis, Paul the son of our school of business namesake, and Phyllis is his granddaughter of Brigham Young himself, which hundreds of, there are hundreds of them. If not a thousand were their grandchildren of Brigham, but not my many like her, what an incredible pair they were. By the way, Hudson designed the Wattis home in Ogden. I have worked on it twice, inside and out. Like almost all of the great wealth, including the Eccles, most just moved. I moved to right out of, I, I came right out of Weber High type class and I had to bell out to the parking lot. I belonged there anyway. So when I started college in 1991, for the second time, by the way, I had, to start from scratch. I've done my own little study on how many men in Weber County my age 50 can type, at least 30 words a minute. My results are less than 2%. So learning to use WordPerfect DOS and type at the same time was very rough for me, much tougher than Clyde Cooley's 440 class, which in the 90s was considered the toughest class on the campus to get through. So I, I again, was one of the only two males in the class. I was older than my male count classmates who had learned in high school. As I was memorizing the command shift F7, etc., there was talk in the Wada School of Business that Microsoft and WordPerfect were developing in the newest gadget called a mouse. They were going to incorporate the mouse, which had been around for years and nobody wanted to use. I was a very aggressive der derivative trader in those days on my own options on tech stocks. I had a few of my finance Dr. Cooley friends who would trade options in the Wattis Building Computer Lab with me, like mad. The internet was brand new, but we were sniffing out tech equities like a Springer Spaniel, like my Springer Spaniels find pheasants. I had just discovered Yahoo. When you logged into the internet, you had a screen that gave five icons, options as search engines. The search engines were brand new. I like to use Raging Bull. It was one of the five. Then one day Yahoo showed up, and I had read that a couple of students and a professor that had come up with the idea via class assignments at Stanford, and one of the students had opened a, a direct uh, dictionary and closed his eyes and pointed to the word Yahoo. I have to buy calls on this, I told myself, so I did. I made a lot of money. I was trading options when very few in the United States even knew what an option was. Then came the motley fool, I Omega home run, right while I was in academia height. Dr. Cooley was having fits about I, I Omega's multiples. He was a fundamentalist, as I am, finance, finance fundamentalist, not Mormon, no, 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 no. Although, we went off one day in the summer of 1995 about I Omega's $1,700 PE ratio. Ann Brinkley and I took the class together. We were friends and sat next to each other. Dr. Cooley, like all business professors, loved her. A girl with that kind of brain and all those looks. I knew to stay close to her, it would give me some cover. He was brutal. His average grade was a D. He sent hundreds of students one building down to the slacker building, as I used to call it. No offense to all you social science grads. There was a young man working in the finance department at Iomega at the time. He was in our 420 finance Clyde Cougar class. It was a small class. Only finance majors would take it for the most part. All of our majors avoided Dr. Cooley like the plague. I started out with very high scores on his test. Dr. Cooley knew I had a successful business and he knew I traded derivatives. He respected me because of my understanding of derivatives but cut me no slack and would go at me big time. You know how everyone says absolutely these days. I say big time. It is my favorite if you have not noticed yet. Anne gave me cover and would interrupt him with a question while he was on attack. She was the only one that could get away with it. While we were attending that quarter, I would send Anne to get info from the Iomega Finance employee. I knew she could get info out of anyone. She just flashed her big blue eyes and everything she wanted was right there. I was watching Motley Fool like a hawk in those days. They seemed to know Iomega's numbers to a T. And one day Ann said, you do not 
have to get me to ask for the info, and you can do it yourself. He is happy to do it. So I went up to him and asked him, have you heard anything on Ahmed's numbers this quarter? Oh yeah, they are going to report this and that. And I said, how do you know? My father-in-law is the so-and-so is an exec at I Omega. I walked to Van and said, you are not kidding. He sings big time. I thought I had some real info. Well, the next day, my friend Ryan, who was a young genius in a graduate program at 19 years old, I ran into him in the Wattis building. I said to him, there's a guy in our 440 class that has given up I Omega's numbers. He says, oh yeah, you mean Bobby? We have been on that gig for over a year. Everyone on the campus knows. He's an accounting student with me. You did not tell me? I thought you knew. Everyone on campus knows. I was the last to know. He was one of the two feeding Motley Fool with its info. And I found that out years later. One of them, I believe, went to prison. They made Motley Fool and I Omega was the fastest growing equity in the United States history at the time. It was a hyped up Motley Fool gift from the gambling gods. The two brothers and the ESPN executive have these two real Motley Fools to thank. He has his own show, pardon the eruption, that's him, that's him. They got rich, very rich. I Omega was right up the road from my house. It was the first of the ridiculous pumped up tech bubble stocks. It was ahead of its time. I Omega fully crew were truly the beginning of a whole bunch of crazy tech equities. The first inner stock chat room home run. I Omega was the birth of the 1990s technology bubble equities. The stock went crazy and made millionaires out of thousands of Utahns. We had Novell, we had I Omega. We had word perfect. Everyone had a friend or a relative that was getting rich off stock options, whether it was the presidents of the said companies or the janitors. Our school business had become very elite in the 90s. We were, were constantly in the top 10 undergraduate scores on the exit testing because of one man, the legendary Clyde Cooley. He was a brilliant genius, and no one s snuck under the radar with him. I remember a student being close friends with Senator Orrin Hatch and trying to use a letter Senator Hatch had written to the school to get into this student into Dr. Cooley's program. I remember the conversation after class one day. Wow, it did not work, and Dr. Cooley told him what he could do with his letter. Dr. Koo is an ex-shell oil chemical engineer and moved to finance later in life, a Chicago guy, a University of Utah guy. As time evolved that year, I as my stock price went was going crazy. My mother, my father, who was a working class investor who had played the stock market and futures markets his entire life. Ogden Uva was a cattle futures mecca for decades. The Ogden Starkyards folded in this my opening to the door to the neocon bliss, hots and again, the arch. It was grand. Next book. I have some great stories about that place, including what happened to the early at Thomas More on Yellowstone Grand Canyon Lithel on the wall. Extremely valuable. More neo ignorance. They let it burn down. He had bought 1,200 shares of I Omega a few years earlier, my father, at $2 a share. I told him it was a total waste of money. They had nothing. Boy, was I wrong. They had developed the zip storage technology just a few months later. His small amount of shares was now 4,800 shares and trading at $50. I was in his ear every day. This thing is grossly overpriced and it will crash on you. At least hedge it. It was very overpriced via the Motley Fool hype. I had made $80,000 in the options market that summer with a bankroll of $1,200 trading everything but I Omega. I had been hearing all over the Wattis lab for weeks rumored that Motley Fool was going to pull the plug and negative art was going to appear on Motley Fool. I knew Motley Fool was the fuel making the equity go crazy. I Omega Motley made Motley Fool. Or did Motley Fool make I Omega? And fools out of all of us. What is the greater fool theory? Uh, talk about pump and dump people who got away with it. Those Motley Fool guys talk about criminals. I finally went to my mother and had a long talk with her about selling his $24,000 investment, or $2,400 investment that was now worth $245,000, as many Ogdenites were married to their I Omega stock. So was he having a love affair with his I Omega stare? Oh yeah. But we lived in Ogden. I attended this Wattis school business, Wattis of Utah Construction, one of the builders of the Hoover Dam, one of the greatest self-made multi-millionaires of Ogden, Utah Construction. The stock went straight up for decades, a company founded by the Wattis brothers and later David Eccles himself, the father of American Oz, who was later the president of Utah Construction and so many other companies, who were all Mormon immigrants living in Ogden Valley as they called it Huntsville, Eden, Liberty. The Eccles with the McKays from Scotland, Utah Construction, 
and later bought out by General Electric. Utah Construction stock had made right here in Ogden some of the richest people in America. That equity was in many Ogdenites' minds. Utah Construction, American Eccles Company, they had very strong family ties with the McKay family, who Alan Ashen is the grandson of. The McKays and the Eccles, the Glasgow, Scotland slum immigrants to Utah together with nothing. I, as a young man, always wondered how one of the Ogden, Utah high schools in 1953 or 1960, Ben Loman Scots, Ben Loman Peak itself, named by the said early Scots, got away with having a mascot named after an ethnic group. Remember, this was not 1805. Ben Loman High School was later in the 50s or 60s, and one of the only two Ogden schools in Ogden. The Paramount Pictures logo, known as Majestic Mountain, was molded after Ben Lomond Peak. Here's my home in Ogden. William Hodgkin was an Ogdenite. He did draw it on napkin. His first theater was in Ogden. Ogden was a very ethnic, diverse, progressive community in 1960. When I got older, I understood two of the greatest economic, self-made religious and economic fortunes were from Scotland. That mountain in the background, that's why I use it on all my videos. That is Ben Lomond. Now you know. I finally pulled my trump card and went to my mother. I knew my mother could talk some sense into my father, so the next morning she pressured him into selling. He called his broker and sold most of his position for $187,000. He told he he held the other position. He could not give up all of that love affair. My mother said he sold at a price, and then I Omega was I Om I-M-O-N-G, which was I-Omega's tip consumer, MSMFT, Microsoft's, NOVL, Novell's. I just saw watching MB use the ticker symbol, sorry. Over the next hour, ticked up a few points. He was watching CNBC. My mom said he called me every name in the book. She said he was sure he was going to knock me out when he seen me next. He was the type and still in the condition that he probably would have been able to do it. It closed at a price much lower than he sold at that day. I stopped by that night and had I had two houses at the time, one right next door, a huge home I was just finishing around the corner. My mother told me the story of him having a fit after the sale. I went over to him and said, so you were a little mad at me at first. He said, what do you mean? Have you seen that rookie the Braves have? He is something else, like nothing had happened. He was a baseball nut, and so was I. That was only two years later after the strike. Two years before. I hated the Braves. He knew it because of Glavin. Tom Glavin was the players rep in the strike nightmare of 1994. I loved the Expos that year. They had a huge lead and the best record in baseball, not to mention Tony Ginn was batting 390 plus and had a real chance of 400. It had been done in 43. Year, had not been done in 43 years. Ted Williams, 1941, 406. I was rooting for the Indians big time in 99. My favorite player at the time was finishing his career with the Indians, Eddie Murray. I was like many, a child of the 60s, and the Orioles were a powerhouse in the 60s and 70s. Earl Weaver was my favorite sports figure of all time. Brooks Robinson, my favorite player in the 60s. When he retired, Eddie Murray, the great Orioles hitter, became my favorite. My father knew all of this. We watched, played, talked, and coached baseball every day my entire life. Every conversation we ever had about anything had baseball in the said conversation. It was World Series time in 1995, the year I Omega was starting its motley fool run. Glavin was pitching game seven in just a few days. I was at Caesar's Palace and had bet 4,000 straight up on the Indians out of hate of Glavin and love for Eddie Murray. Something is an equity trade and derivative trade I never did. Trade on emotion. That is why I was able to make a career out of trading derivatives because I never traded on emotion. Of course, Glavin pitched the jam, one of the greatest final series games ever pitched by anyone and he went from being booed by his own fans to being the only brave to close out a series on the incredible 14-year run. Many Ognites were brave fans in those days because Glenn Hubbard was an Ognite, Ben Lomond Scott, and played for the Braves until he was traded to the A's in 1988. Glenn's younger brother and I, Steve, were very close friends. In fact, we had a big party in 88, game one. At, at the series. Hubbard playing second base for the A's. I was rooting for the Dodgers in 1888. I love Lasorda. He managed here in Ogden all through the 60s. The Triple A Ogden Dodgers. I was the only one in the room rooting very quietly to myself. The room was full of very strong, gifted athletes. When Gibson hit that home run off Dennis Eckley, which I hated all that neat hair, it bothered me. I jumped up and screamed, 
repeated that great call. I could not help myself. One of the greatest calls of all time, but the greatest announcer maybe of all time, Jack Buck. I don't believe what I just saw. Sorry, Harry, Ernie, or Vince, one of the four greatest, I should say. I was chased down the road by everyone in the room, including my father, who loved Glenn. I still to this day have some of Glenn's brothers and friends that want to kick my ass over that. A few days later, there it was, the negative article, and I make it was tumbling down fast. The Motley Fool pump and dump mega scam was ending. I was an idiot for not buying puts then. I know hundreds of people who wrote it all the way up and all the way down. I would always say owning a stock is like owning a racehorse. The good ones you fall in love with, and they will lose you every penny that you made you trying to keep that dream alive. I have always said, I own racehorses for two minutes at a time, and I own derivatives options for a week at a time. I never own them to the point that I have to clean the stalls or feed them. I was literally rich from the equities of Novell, Connexton, Yahoo, 3Com, Palm, and others. I had puts on Netscape when Gates teed them up. I had made enough to build the biggest home on 10 acres in the area with cash in days in the derivatives market. While I was attending one of the toughest business schools in the country, Dr. Cooley's Weaver State Finance Program, Mike Vaughn was the Wattis School Business Dean then. He knew what I was up to and was in full support of me. Dr. Cooley had me teaching two-week seminars in the School of Business on how to trade derivatives. It was on the technology boom, the great technology boom of the 1980s and 90s was in full glorious flight. One day while in the Wattis lab in the 90s, I was taking, talking with a classmate who knew Bruce Bastian, a friend of the Bastian family, who started talking about WordPerfect and rumors that it was going to go public finally. We had been hoping for a public offering for years. He said, you know Bruce came out of the closet. What? Do the, found, the founders were BYU guys. One of them, David O. McKay's grandson. David O. McKay, the former president of the church from our place in this country, he was the president of our university. We were state for a while, the second president of our university. A friend of both of my grandfathers. A man when I was a young boy was taught, when asked who was the president, I did not say Lyndon Johnson. I like every child in Utah, said David O. McKay. He was a cultural giant in Ogden, Utah in the 60s. His white suit and his calm, intelligent presence was powerful, big time powerful. The uncle of the incredible writer and very Mormon controversial Fawn McKay, who lived and went to the same school I went to, Weber High School. The writer and the name that was never even spoken at Weber High School. Her name was Taboo, and 99.9% .9 of Weber High grads to this day have no clue that who she is, which there is no doubt in my mind she is the most accomplished Weber High graduate in that is long much history by the way, who is one of the greatest writers and historians of all time. I absolutely love her work. I would never dip my toe into the Joseph Smith controversies as she did. That woman had guts. She feared no one. It is not my bag to question religion theology. I do not have the religious education to do so, even if I want to. I left the Mormon church in practice at the age of 14. I do get called lost boy in New York City. I do not question anyone's religious beliefs or origins. I know. Repeat. Repeat. Word perfect. Pete, myself. Sometimes. 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 Self sometimes. Times. Go Mets. But her book and writing is something I absolutely love. Her Thomas Jefferson and intimate history and incredible work. I said the grandson of David McKay is gay. He said no. The other one. Bastion. Not Ashton. What is he? Gay? No. Yes, he has been thrown out of the whole circle. I said, who is the brains and operators? Pete runs the show, but he is it is Bruce and Alan's baby. They call all of the shots. He is going to leave the company. I said, you know Microsoft and Gates are talking about this mouse bullshit. That is long before anyone even knew what a mouse was. I at the time was eat, sleep, and drinking technology equities. Microsoft, he knew. He was talking about the university's communities in Utah. WordPerfect going to merge with Microsoft? Is WordPerfect going to go public? Are they going to switch to a mouse device? As the conversation went on, I said, I cannot believe anyone would simply move to the said mouse device. WordPerfect has 90% plus percent of the market. I was thinking out loud and said, it has always been and will always be Shift F7. Too many people have been branded. Always been, always was. Only a very few years of the operation itself was new. I don't know if Bruce himself 
told him or a relative or a friend told him of this, but I did know that Gates was extremely aggressive and he had said he heard that Gates thought Pete and Allen were, not, were too passive. Of course, this is all hearsay. In those days, Utah was full of hearsay and rumors. It was the infant of the tech bubble in the 90s. Who knows the truth? Surely not me. But Brew Bashan did come out, and he did sell his position. He was a staunch Mormon with a wife and kids. Gates teed them up big time. It is ironic the entire proposi California proposition battle is being fought and funded as a Utah debate. The Mormon community on one side, Bruce Bastion on the other side. I wonder what runs through Alan Ashen's mind in regard to all this. Here his grandson of David McKay, a Mormon giant, and a very devoted Mormon himself, yet Bruce Bastion has to have a very good place in his heart. What I know of Al Ash and Bruce Branch from reading and conversations with people who knew them, again, all hearsay, say, 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 control, alt, delete, hurry. I have heard nothing personally ever said negative about either of them. They both are very highly respected men in Utah, from what I know, but I am a plaster. Shift F.U. Gates 13.